Was I, okay, yeah, I got my keys. I got my, okay, my, I got my coffee and, okay, my presentation. My presentation. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Wait, I'm forgetting something. No, I'm not. I'm good. Wait. <laughs> Never mind. I'm late. I got to go. Ah. What in the world? How did I? Okay. Something's wrong. How... Okay. I, I cannot be around people like this. I can't go to work like this. How, how did these get here in the first place? My goodness. What? No, I got... Okay. No, like... Okay. I, I can't reach. Like, I'm trying to change. Why can't I move? No. Ah! It hurts. I. <sighs> okay, God. <clears throat> I'm waiting. Can I help here? Whenever you're ready. I'm ready. We're talking about made new again. Somebody say made new again. And if you don't understand what we're talking about, we're talking about the old model versus the new model. And there was an older model, which in that model, there was a sacred place, a sacred text, a sacred man. It was never a sacred woman because women weren't allowed in the sanctuary, right? A sacred man and, and, and a suspicious following. So we just followed because we were told to. We didn't understand we didn't really comprehend, but that's what they told us was right. So we believe that was right, and that's what we move forward. And thank God for the old model, but Jesus came to give us a new model. Jesus didn't come for that old model. He came for a new model. And what I loved about the little demonstration today is some of us don't realize that we're still living an old model. And the truth is, if I can be honest with you, it's hard to get out of that model by yourself. Imagine if your, if your vest was on backwards and it was buttoned. How would you get out of that model? And, and the reason I felt it's so important to start the year this way, family, is because a lot of us don't realize that although there's, there's a new desire inside of us, often we sprinkle it with the old model. We throw a little condemnation in there. We throw a little separation in there. We throw a little bit of our opinion in there. We throw a little bit of that sacred place and that sacred text and that sacred man. Does that make sense? Well, Pastor Eli, surely there's a sacred text. Well, look, man, here's what happened. Just stay with me historically. Originally, only the Pope and those who were leading the Catholic Church had access to the Scriptures. You remember that? Then came this great revolution. We got the printing press, and they actually made Scripture available to us. And now you get the Protestant movement, the Reformation. John, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, he, the, the, what was his name? The Reformer? I just lost his name. Martin Luther, thank you. Martin Luther never tried to leave the church. He tried to reform the church, but he was kicked out. Ever say kicked out. So now all of a sudden you got the Scripture everywhere. And you're not going to believe this. Instead of unifying us with Scripture, guess what it did? Scripture separated us. Because you thought it was like this, and I thought it was like that. So you go do it your way, and I'll go do it my way. And what began, what began as a desire to reform the church began to what we have now today, over 2,500 different Protestant denominations who meet separately, who do things their own way, because instead of using Scripture to unite us, we use Scripture to divide us. So listen, I believe, I believe that the Word of God is beyond a doubt the Word of God. But what I also believe and have come to understand is that many of us use the Word of God to sprinkle the old model with. And what I'm saying to you is simply this, the Word of God is not a rule, it's a template. There are things that are very clear in the Word of God. There are things that are very clear. But most of all is the commandment that God gave us that includes every commandment. If you follow the one commandment, you won't need the other. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your strength, all your might, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. 
And I know what I would rather do. I'd rather pull up John. I'd rather pull up Mark. I'd rather pull up the scripture and tell you what I'm thinking. But here's what I don't want to do. I don't want to have to love you because that takes too much energy. Look, look at your neighbor and say, he's all by himself. He's all by himself. So we want to talk today not about a sacred place and not about a sacred text and not about a sacred man. We want to talk about a new model that Jesus came and gave his life that we could have. See, the old model, somebody say the old model, was all about consumption. I came to get what I need because I want to go home. Give me what I need. I came to give you what you wanted. Give me what I wanted so I could go home. Here's the sacrifice. Wash my sin. I want to go home. That's not the model that Jesus came. The model that Jesus came to give is much different. Everybody say different. The model of of Jesus wasn't for us to consume. It was for us to engage. We needed to engage. We needed to belong. We needed to be a part of something. Somebody say a part. So it's important for you and I to learn to find our place, to contribute our warmth, and to advance the kingdom. It's an engagement model. It's not a one-size-fits-all. It's a custom, a specific Detailed plan under God's grace. And it requires engagement. Somebody say engagement. In the old model, you could come to church, sit in the back row, check off the box, and go home. That's the old model because you did what was required. In the new model, God wants us to connect to him, connect to his word, and connect to each other. That old model of coming out. Again, remember I said this to you, and I'll say it to you one more time. That the, the old model is more complex. Started off with 10 rules, ended with over 600. The new model is easier to understand. You got one rule. Even though it's easier to understand, it is far more demanding. Somebody say more demanding. More demanding. So in order to bring some level of clarity, actually, let me talk a little bit more about engagement. Somebody say engagement. See, a lot of us are focused much more with coming to the temple, fulfilling our responsibilities, and going home. That's the old model. But engaging is what Jesus wants us to do because that's the new model. Everybody say engage. Don't come to church, check the box, go home, engage. Now, how many of you, uh, and I'm going to be really cautious with this because I know that there are a lot of us who have experienced some level of struggle with this, so so let me be mindful. But how many of you right now would love to do without one of your uh, uh, limbs? How many of you would like to use all your limbs? Nobody right now is going to sign up to give up a limb. Matter of fact, if you signed up to give up a limb today, would we call you weird? I mean, you could donate a kidney. Why would you donate a kidney? Because you got two. You can function with one. Right? But how many of you are going to sign up to donate a leg right now? You going to sign up to donate an arm? Because the truth is, you need all of your parts together to feel whole. Are you ready for this? A church is never complete if you're not engaged. It's like one of our body parts off to the side. Are you ready for this? You are never complete if you're not engaged. There's always something missing. What's missing? I go to church, but something's missing. Oh, it's the preacher. Probably not. Oh, I go to church and something's missing. It's probably the worship. Eh, Probably not. I go to church, something's missing. There's not enough coffee. Probably not. What's probably missing is that you're not in, you're attending, but you're not engaging. Right? Okay, moving right along. Ever say right along? I think it's necessary in this model to redefine some things so that we can understand how to move forward in this new model. I know what I'm sharing with you. Some of you have already written me off like, Pastor Eli, you're crazy, yada, yada, yada. Drink your haterade. Bring it on. I love it. It's all good. Look at your neighbor and say, haters are going to hate. And some of you like, Pastor Eli, I never understood the power of God's love that way. So I'm going to share a little bit more with you. Everybody say a little bit more. Oh, man, I forgot to read this to you. Can I back up just a little bit? Sweet, because I was, I was going to back up anyways. Um, I want to read something to you. This is an article that I was using in preparation. I'll let you know what Christianity 
what kind of impact they made in the world they were in. The ancient world was both decadent and cruel. The practice of infanticide, infanticide I'm not sure if I'm enunciating that right, but the, 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 um, the killing of innocent children or children, for example, was widespread and legal throughout the Greek and Roman world during the early days of Christianity. In fact, abortion, infanticide, and sacrifice, uh, sacrifices of children were extremely popular. Uh, and common throughout the ancient world. Listen to this. In 10 or in 43 BC, Serio, writing in the period before Christ, cited the 12 tables of Roman law when he wrote, deformed infants should be killed. Similarly, Seneca in, 39, in AD 39 wrote, we drown children who are at birth weakly and abnormal. An ancient writer of Plutra said this in AD 46-120, discussing the casual acceptance of child sacrifice, mentioned that the Carthaginians, who often offered up their own children and who had no children of those who had no children of their own would buy children from the poor people and then take them to the temple and sacrifice. Everybody say new model. Old model would sit there and go, man, those people are so bad. God's going to judge them. You know what the Christians were known for in this moment? J.C., in this moment, the Christians would go to those temples where children would be sacrificed or where children would be drowned or where children were going to be given up. And those people who were poor, because remember, to be Christian at that moment, you gave up status, you gave up opportunity. So most of those people were poor. And Pastor Lee, what they would do is the children that others would throw away, they would pick up, bring into their own home, and raise them as their own. That was the mark of Christianity. That was the new model that Jesus came to give us. And that's the model that I, I feel. And, and that, listen, the truth is, I'm, I'm preaching this at you guys right now. And there's no like this real pretty message. And there's no real cool message. And I like preaching cool stuff. And we're not going super deep right now or anything like that. I'm talking to you about something that is so difficult because it's simple to understand. But man, is it demanding. And some of us are going to go, Pastor Eli, you're crazy. And, and the truth is, I may preach this message for a whole year and you all leave. And nothing may ever change. And maybe we're all the same. But I'm taking a risk here that maybe some of us would begin to capture for a moment what Christianity really is and have the courage to live it out the way God intended it for us to be. That makes sense? So I'm going to take this risk. And I'm going to redefine a word uh, that I think has been uh, misunderstood in the old model. So I'm going to say spirituality. When we say spirituality, we often think about somebody who gets up and preaches so good that, oh, my God, you get goosebumps on your goosebumps, or they sing so good, and, oh, my God, you just feel this something, or, or they have such a connection with God, and every time they speak, watch. Matter of fact, I'm going to read the scripture that defines spirituality for us. Are you ready? Here's the scripture in Galatians that defines spirituality. Are you ready? But the fruit of the Spirit is insight, knowledge, understanding of the deeper things of faith, and the ability to make people hang on your every word. Somebody remember that scripture? <laughs> I hope you don't, because I made it up. I made it up because that's what a lot of us think that spirituality is. But can I show you what real spirituality is? Watch this. Here's real spirituality. Check this out. But the fruit of the Spirit is, say it with me, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and what do you mean being spiritual doesn't mean how many scriptures you can quote off the, or how deep you go into, or how many revelations of depth that you know? That's not being spiritual? No. As a matter of fact, if you will, if you will look at the application, pull that up for me one more time. If you look at the application of the gifts of the Spirit, they are horizontal, not vertical. Matter of fact, Real spiritual people aren't people on the sacred place expounding the sacred text, wearing sacred garb. Real spiritual people are the people who are loving neighbors, who are determining to be joyful no matter what they're going through, who are sharing peace, sharing patience, 
who are sharing kindness, goodness, are you ready, and self-control. How does that manifest? How does that manifest? Does God need you to be self-controlled? No, I promise you God's going to be who he is whether or not you have self-control. God's going to be who he is whether or not you have patience. But you know who patience can really help? Your husband. Your wife. Your co-worker. Somebody next to you. Somebody around us. Everybody say horizontal. Horizontal. The gifts of the Spirit are not for you connecting with God. If I want to be some, if I want to see somebody who's really spiritual, it's not how somebody dresses. Matter of fact, my children berated me this morning. One of my children said, Dad, you going to a funeral? I'm like, well, not unless your mama's done with you. Another one of my children said, Dad, who do you think you are? John Wick, you going to go kill somebody today? Oftentimes, oftentimes we determine people's spirituality by what they do on a platform. That's called charisma. Or how they communicate. That's called preparation. Or how they sing. That's called giftedness. Does that make sense to anybody today? How do I know that those are the gifts of the Spirit? Well, number one, they're horizontal. Number two, you notice something else about those things? They're sacrificial. They're sacrificial. Here's something else about those amazing spiritual gifts. You can feel them and experience them. I said this last week. I want to say it one more time. You know, nobody ever left the church because of how much we love Jesus. Nobody resists God because of how much we love Jesus. You know why they don't come to church? You know why they don't like the church? Because how hard it is to be patient with each other. How hard it is to love one another, be kind to each other. Come on, somebody. That's why they don't like the church. And the very reason they resist the church are the very same things the church should be resisting. Who that's good preaching right there. The very reason they resist the church are the very things the very church should be resisting. How many of you have ever wanted to talk about somebody in the church? Don't even lie. You're in church. Have you ever? How did that person just cut in front of me in the church coffee shop? Oh, my gosh. Why am I working with a coworker from church? This person. And how we handle each other. Some say each other. How we handle each other is really what people don't like. Our definition of spirituality needs to change a little bit. Somebody say change a little bit. So instead of thinking about insight, knowledge, understanding of the deeper things of faith and the ability to make people hang on every word, it's about how we love people, how we, and everybody say joy. I don't want to kill this, this scripture because most of you know that, but joy is not happiness. Happiness is a word that we draw from circumstance. So happy birthday. Thank you so much for the birthday wishes, right? I'm supposed to be happy because of the circumstance, which is the day of my birth. That's happiness. Joy is an attitude of happiness no matter what the circumstances. That's a spiritual gift, to be happy no matter what happens to you. And when people see that, they're going to think, man, what's wrong with that person? Well, you have a Jesus they don't have a grip on. Does that make sense? Makes sense. And here's another one I'm going to redefine. Are you ready? First one was spirituality. Here's the second one. And this will be the conclusion of my talk today. It really will. I'm not, I'm not going to talk long. This message that I'm talking to you the last couple of days, I hope you heard last week. If you didn't catch last week, go back and hear it. Uh, and if this is new to you, this is, this is why I'm preaching. Like next week, I promise you as I conclude this message, next week, women, you're going to want to come hear this message. I'm going to show some things to you in the new model about women that's going to blow your mind. Man, you're going to want to be here. I promise you. So if you're not, if you haven't quite decided whether or not you're going to follow Jesus, I hope that you use this as what the church is supposed to be like and recognize that we're humans with frailty trying to get it right. Look at your neighbor and say, we're trying to get it right. Trying to get it right. The second word I'd like to redefine for you is holiness. Holiness. Say it with me, holiness. Here's your phrase. Write this down. Holiness in the new model is about being a part of rather than being apart from. Holiness in the new model 
is about being a part of rather than being a part from. In the old model, we based it on the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, Luis, here's what God said to his people. Don't hang out with those people. Don't hang out with those sinners. Don't get close to those people. Matter of fact, don't marry their women. Don't cook their food. Don't do what they do. You stay apart. Be separate from them. That was the old model. Right? And so sometimes we get to church, Pastor Lee, and we got Christian coffee shop. And we go to Christian yoga, and we have Christian yogurt, and we have Christian. We got testaments, the Christian mint, because the other mints are secular mints. And I'm not going to have secular mints in my mouth. So what we do is we take this word and we start pulling ourselves apart. What did Jesus do when he came? Jesus didn't hang out in the synagogue. Jesus didn't hang out with all the Christian folk. Jesus started hanging out with everybody who needed him. Now, I just want, I want you to understand this for a minute because somebody would say, listen, if I say to you, hey, man, you got to be strong and love people, you're going to say, yeah, like, I'm not Jesus. Pastor Eli, I can't forgive somebody like that. I'm not Jesus, right? But I say, hey, go hang out with the world, and you're like, oh, well, Jesus did that. I'm going to do that. Here's the difference between Jesus hanging out in the world and many people today who go out and hang out in the world. Nobody who Jesus hang out with did he become like. Jesus hung out with people who were far from him so that he could make them part of him. Does that make sense? In the old model, holiness is not defined by what you stay away from but how you become a part of. How are you becoming a part of changing your environment? How are you becoming a part of hanging with people who need Jesus? Everybody say Jesus. The new model is defined as engaging. The old model is defined as separating. Pastor Eli, what are you talking about? John chapter 1 verse 14 said that Jesus left heaven and the word came and he dwelt among us. He dwelt among, Jesus hung out with while we were yet sinners. And look, you can't go to somebody, you can't go to somebody who is a sinner and act weird and then act like you're doing something for Jesus. Most of us get that. Most of us get that. But I just want you to know, if you come along with somebody who has, who is a sinner in the light of our understanding, right, who is far from God, if you come up to somebody and you know that they're, not divorced, and they're hanging out with somebody else, how are you going to treat them? Uh Uh-huh. Nice to be you, huh? Don't hang out with her. Don't go over there, Myrtle. Don't hang out with her. Look, man, listen. If you fear that you're going to become like them, you should walk away. But those of us who understand the new model understand that Jesus is in us. And because Jesus is in us, they can't take him from us. We need to take him to them. Well, you know, if I'm going to go to dinner with you, you better not drink a beer. Let let them do what they do. You do what you do. You do what you do. You be who you are. Look at someone say, be who you are. I'm going to break it down for you in just a minute. As a matter of fact, um, one of the marquee scriptures that we built Changing Point Church on is Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 and 19. I'd like to share with you right now. Are you ready? Listen to this. Therefore, go. Therefore, what? See, the old model said, stay in Jerusalem, retake the temple. Remember that, Bernie? Jesus, you're coming back, right? Jesus, you're coming back, and, and you're going to establish Jerusalem, right? And, and I'm going to be at your right hand, and he's going to be at your left hand, and everybody wants power, and everybody wants authority. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. Nobody's coming back to the temple, guys. Nobody's going to lift up Jerusalem again, guys. What we got to do now, it's our turn, tag, you're it. You got to go. Well, go where? 
Go to all the nations. Somebody say all the nations. You know what that means? People who don't look like you. You want me to hang out with a Mexican? You want me to hang out with an African American? You want me to hang out with a Caucasian? A German American? Pastor, Germans, you know, Germans are bad people. What? How is it that we're going to sit here in an old model attitude and blame one person as if though the whole nationality is that one person? We become culpable of the same things we look at other people. So listen to me, real Christianity family is to go, somebody say go, to all nations. All nations. When was the last time you reached out to a different ethnic group? Well, you know, pastor, we just kind of, you know. No, no, when was the last time intentionally you went out to another? How many of you ever been to the Bahamas? Come on, how many have been to Hawaii? How many ever traveled outside the United States of America? 90% of us who did that did that to vacation. Right? Or you were running from the law, but we'll pray for you later, right? <laughs> Most of us did it to vacation, and here's, my, here's what I'm saying to you today. When was the last time you crossed the lunchroom? To talk to somebody who was from a different nation. Different nation. No, I'm, I'm saying this honestly. I'm saying this honestly because I'm going to talk to you next week about a new ethic. But here's what Jesus tells us that Christians do. Here's what holiness is. I'm not going to look at Derek and go, well, Derek's a different color than me. I look at Derek's son as if though he was my blood. I look at him and it didn't matter that he married somebody. Matter of fact, he's more Hispanic than his wife. We're praying for Dulce right now. Right? Yeah, no, no, that has nothing to do with the skin color. It doesn't. But the truth is, if we don't admit that there are some challenges and barriers and we don't become intentional, then, guys, we're not going. We're not going, and we got to go. And the gospel isn't about come and listen in the temple. What good is it if you come and listen and you never go? You got to engage, and you got to go. Spirituality is about engagement. Holiness is about going. A lot of us fear that if we ever had the courage to step out, we might not have the ability to endure. This next part blows my mind. I, all my life, Luis, holiness to me was being separate. And I've, Bernie, we had some incredible separate moments where God did some amazing things, not belittling that. But for most of us, that would be the end of that experience. So it ended with the location or it ended with that service. That was the holy moment and it was over. But I want you to notice something so specific that happened when Jesus died. When Jesus died, everybody say he died. The Bible said that the earth shook. But J.C. Luke put it very clearly. Luke was the doctor. He was the doctor. And the doctor was really careful about how he gave this information. He said, listen to me. Before the earth quaked and the temple destroyed, something else happened. There was a room in the temple called the Holy of Holies. Somebody say the Holy of Holies. That's like the Holy of Holies. That's like super holy. A priest could only go that in that room once a year. And you may not know this, but let me tell you, he had to go with a rope tied on his leg, MacGyver. He had a rope tied on his leg. You know why the rope was tied on his leg? Because if he had an itty bit of sin, he would die when he walked in the room and they would have to pull him out. That's how holy that room was. And Isaiah, when Jesus died, the very first thing he did was walk through the old model, past the outer court, into the inner court, and he got to the curtain that separated humanity from that holy place. And he reached from the top to the bottom, and he ripped it open. 
The Bible said the veil was ripped and then the earthquake crumbled the temple. Why did the earthquake happen after the ripping of the veil? Because God wanted us to never be confused. It wasn't the earthquake that ripped the veil. It was him who ripped the veil. Because the message is no longer will you have to come to a room to meet my holiness. I am going to come and take my holiness and I'm going to deposit it on the inside of you. So every time you get next to another believer, you're getting next to the holy of holies. The very raw and awesome presence of the living God. It's a new model. It's a new model. Why should I treat you special? Why should I love you? Because inside of me is the holy of holies. And inside of you is the holy of holies. Why would Jesus be amongst wine bibbers without fear? Because in him, was the presence of the Father. Why was Jesus with prostitutes having conversations that no other man would have? Because in him was the Holy of Holies. Maybe instead of coming to a place, waiting for a sacred text, maybe we could come to the realization today that God put his most prized possession in his most weakest vassals. And instead of waiting for a preacher to stir you up, what if you got on your knees in your house and began to stir up that holy place on the inside of you So that instead of coming out in anger, instead of coming out in bitterness, instead of coming out in regret, instead of it being heavy to serve God, instead of it being difficult to move forward, what if on the inside of you, you connected to the Holy of Holies and it became the source of your love? I get it. I get it now. How do you love your enemies? Because you access that from the Holy of Holies. How do you forgive the unforgivable? I get it. Because you access the Holy of Holies. God's not going to do it already done it and it's already inside of you well why don't I feel it well maybe you're waiting on an old model for a preacher to stir up what God already deposited inside of you I love the scripture I read the scripture every day but I come to understand Maria that for me the scripture is a template for us the scripture is is a template to live out a love that conquers the world as we know it today. Julian the Apostate, the last pagan emperor of Rome, so understood the power of this new model. These Christians who they tried to kill, persecute, torment, and eradicate. He would later on go on to say, these impious Galileans, not only do they feed their own, but they feed ours also. Welcoming them in with their agape, uh, they attract them as children are attracted to cakes. While the pagan priests neglect the poor, the hated Galileans devote, devote themselves to the work of charity. And by a display of false compassion, have established the given effect to their pernicious errors. Such practice is common among them and causes contempt for our God. Julian wanted to kill the Christians, and he used that edict to tell everybody how bad they were. Standing next to him, they captured his last words before he died, which were these. Emperor Julian clearly saw the writing on the wall. The Roman Empire would succumb, would not succumb to the political upheaval of force, but of love, the love of Jesus Christ. And Julian's dying words in A.D. 363 were, Visisti Galilee, 
which means you Christians have conquered. The greatest emperor, the greatest empire in all of history was not conquered by those of us who went to war, but those of us who were determined to love. Our question is not why should I do that? question is what does love require what does love require what does love require love conquers love conquers love conquers you may not see it right now. and We may not see all of it. But we're not here because of Martin Luther. We're not here because of the Catholic Church. We're here because one man chose to love and set a model for us that would change the world. So before you argue, before you condemn, before we puff out our chest, about a knowledge or a religion or a church name. Remember this. We owe no man anything but to love him. And love is something we owe. If you have been forgiven, if you have been delivered, what would your work look like if you loved? What would your employees look like if you loved? What would your home look like if we loved? I know this isn't a real spiritual or not a real flowery message. It's really spiritual, but it's not flowery. It's not really, but I promise you, man, if you kind of let beyond the natural and you hear me with the heart of your spirit, if you'll hear me today, you can hear me calling you up to another level in God. Yeah, it's not easy to love. I know sometimes we want to defend ourselves, but isn't God defending you? I know sometimes you want to correct it right now, but isn't God faithful to make sure that all all of us who are called by his name are protected and move forward then what do we do for ourselves we do what love requires stand to your feet with me today